Our next speaker is Justin Dorado, um, master student at SUNY ESF, and he's going to talk to us today about the Atlantic Salmon Restoration in Central New York. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, like Dr. Murphy said, uh, my name is Justin Dorado. I'm a second year master's student at SUNY ESF. And so what I'm going to be learning and talking about this morning is uh, most of the results that I found in my second year of work. So before I get started talking about my project, I wanted to give a quick background on Atlantic salmon. Uh, Atlantic salmon are native to the Lake Ontario watershed, and they were found in many of our tributaries here in central New York. Uh, we've primarily been working in this area here. Uh, but the original strain that lived in Lake Ontario would run uh, our tributaries in the fall, and it was this, at this time that they created a or, uh, created a, a great food source for the Native Americans that lived here, and that transitioned into a great food source for the European settlers during expansion. But as we know, a lot of the offshoots from expansion, pollution, damming of our tributaries, this eventually uh, led to a decline in the original Atlantic salmon population and uh, eventually their extirpation from the watershed by 1900. And so it's been since this time that there's been a number of organizations that have attempted to restore uh, the, the species in the watershed. And uh, until recently, most of these results have been fairly, fairly limited. So why do we want to restore Atlantic salmon in the first place? Well, I think we have an inherent obligation to at least try. It is a native top predator to the watershed. It's really a charismatic species. What's interesting about Atlantic salmon as well is that they can tolerate warmer water temperatures than most of our Pacific salmonids, which have lar largely come to replace Atlantic salmon as far as filling the ecological niche that they used to uh, inhibit and have it. And also, Atlantic salmon are a hugely popular sport fish, so it would bring quite a bit of economic uh, benefit to the area here. And uh, I know both of these guys, so. <laughs> so that's kind of the underlying tone for my research here. So what I wanted to do was look at a couple different strains of salmon that are currently being considered for restoration efforts here. I also wanted to look at the abiotic habitat in our tributaries. Obviously our streams are a lot different today than they were 100 years ago when the original Atlantic salmon strain was extirpated. So can the habitat still support them today? And at the same time, I wanted to look at migration barriers in our regional tributaries. Migration barriers were one of the main reasons why Atlantic salmon were extirpated in the first place. Uh, obviously being a migratory sport fish, uh, some one of these need to move between lake and tributary environments to complete their life cycles. So I wanted to see if migration potential is still here. So from these objectives, I developed two hypotheses to test. The first was that there would be no physiological differences between strains of salmon, uh, and that pertains to their survival and growth rates. The second hypothesis I tested was that habitat suitability, suitability and accessibility in subregions in central New York would not be any different. So first, talking about the strains that I was working with. Uh, our first strain comes from Lake Memphis Magog in northern Vermont. I'm going to refer to this as the Magog strain from here on out. Uh, but this particular strain is known to be able to survive pretty high water temperatures in tributaries of Lake Memphis Magog, in that, or, uh, approaching 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, so what, what we think climate change is going to do to our streams here in central New York, if we can find a strain that has maybe already adapted to warmer water temperatures, that may bode well for restoration potential. At the same time, my advisor, Dr. Margaret Murphy, she found this particular strain had high survival and growth rates when she evaluated them in central New York. The second strain I was working with is coming from Sebago Lake. Uh, this particular strain is pretty widely stocked throughout the northeast U.S. It's a very available, a lot of hatcheries are producing it. And this is also the strain that has shown to uh, have the best performance in Lake Champlain in terms of adult returns to original stocking tributaries. So it's these characteristics that make these strains interesting for our work. So I mentioned uh, I was doing my work in a couple different sub-regions in central New York. The first is called the Ontario Drumlins. These are small direct, tri direct tributaries to Lake Ontario, uh, found west of the city of Oswego. And so we had three streams here, which were Rice, Eight Mile, and Little Creeks. The second region I was working in was the Fish Creek region. Fish Creek is a major uh, source tributary to Oneida Lake. And uh, I had three <coughs> additional tributaries here, which were Mad River, Furnace Creek, and Point Rock Creek. And so we know that Atlantic salmon historically used both of these watersheds, which is one of the primary factors that I looked at each of the sub-watersheds. Um, now, there is some differences between each of these regions. For example, the Drumlins does have a higher proportion of urbanization and agriculture, 
Fish Creek region uh, more heavily forested. Being on the Tug Hill Plateau receives a lot more precipitation throughout the year. So there is some regional differences. Um, now, in each of the, uh, the points in these streams, it's probably hard to see in the back, but these uh, the little black points are where uh, we were stocking out both of the strains of salmon and evaluating their growth, uh, and as well as looking at habitat here. So talking a little bit more about that. What I wanted to do was look at the survival and growth of each of these strains. We think that a strain of fish that has uh, higher survival and growth rates is going to offer more potential for restoration. So I adopted this study design here, where we had stocked both strains of our fish in a 100 meters uh, stretch of all of our streams. Uh, I tried to do a start, uh, target stocking density of one fish per square meter. Uh, we did have uh, public fin clips on all of our Magog stream fish. That way, uh, we had stocked them in the, the early summer, when we went back in the late summer to do our uh, electroshocking surveys. If we had caught both strains, we would be able to tell the difference between them. So uh, we used multi-pass depletion uh, electroshocking to sample for these fish. Uh, from that, I was able to estimate survival and look at growth rates. And as far as growth rates go, I wanted to look at two different metrics here. First, I wanted to look at growth in weight using the standardized mass-specific growth rate and growth in length using the absolute growth in length metric. And I wanted to look at both of these because uh, the two strains that we were working with, I had to stock them out at different sizes just because of uh, the rearing conditions uh, from the hatcheries that we received them from. And so I needed to decouple the relationship between length and weight because fish tend to grow at different rates depending on what characteristic you're looking at. So this was kind of a way to validate, is one strain really growing faster than the other? If we're seeing uh, significantly faster growth in both of these different characteristics. Also, like I mentioned, at each of the uh, locations that we had stocked our fish out at, I was looking at some of the habitat and barriers in, in each of these tributaries. So for habitat, I was looking at abiotic habitat characteristics, and I evaluated that with the Habitat Suitability Index developed by Stanley and Trio. Uh, for our barriers, I kind of, I have developed my own migration barrier index, is what I've been calling it, to look at certain hydrologic and geomorphic characteristics of our barriers. So first, the Habitat Suitability Index. This considers 17 environmental characteristics that are known to influence Atlantic salmon survival and productivity in tributaries. So things from water temperature to substrate, velocity, everything like that. And so it scores, scores that habitat based on what we know about Atlantic salmon habitat preferences. For the Migration Barrier Index, the Vermont, Nation, Vermont uh, Agency of Natural Resources had developed a protocol to assess migration barriers. Uh, again, for geomorphic and hydrologic characteristics. So I had taken those methods and applied it to our barriers and the tributaries that we had been working in. And then I looked at the methods from Michael Pital, who used the same protocol in tributaries of Lake Champlain, to evaluate uh, migration barriers for brook trout. And so I came up with a, a pretty similar index to look at our migration potential here in central New York for Atlantic salmon. So moving to our first results here, this is growth in weight. And so all the results that I'm going to talk about from here on out are largely from 2015. So we have our mango strain fish uh, in our gray bars here, the Sebago strain fish in the white bars. And I had split this graph in half with our three streams on the left being the three drumlin streams we studied in 2015. And so what we were seeing was that this mango strain fish was growing significantly faster in terms of weight, which was pretty interesting. That was, that was unanimous across those three streams. When you compare that with what we saw in the fish in the fish creek tributaries, our growth weights were much more similar. And we actually had the Sebago strain growing a little bit faster in Point Rock Creek. So that was an interesting result. And so I was able to validate that with growth in length, where we're seeing a really similar result here. Magog strain fish are still growing faster in the drumlins. We actually have Sebago strain fish growing significantly faster in Point Rock Creek now. And so the most interesting thing that I got out of this part of the work was that we have one strain growing faster in one watershed, the other strain growing faster in the other watershed. And so we needed to figure out why is this going on. So like most salmonids, I think a lot of that is dictated by temperature. And so what we were seeing is that our drumlin streams had a lot warmer temperature profiles in our Fish Creek tributaries. Now these are the average uh, temperature profiles from the summer. Um, and the drumlin streams were always warmer than our Fish Creek tributaries. Now, like I mentioned earlier, what's interesting about Atlantic salmon is they can tolerate warmer water temperatures. 19 degrees Celsius is the optimum water temperature for juvenile Atlantic salmon. And so we're seeing that our fish creek tributaries, on average, may be slightly cooler than what Atlantic salmon would prefer. Our drumlin streams are slightly warmer than what optimum temperature would, would dictate. 
But what was important that we found here is that our drumlin streams never reached lethal temperature levels for salmon. We were always finding salmon at the locations we had stocked them out at. Now, for reference here, this is 17 degrees Celsius. This is the optimum temperature for juvenile rainbow trout. And like many of us know, rainbow trout have largely become established in a lot of the tributaries that Atlantic salmon used to use, primarily in the Ontario watershed. And so what we're seeing here is that each of the study regions we're working in are warmer than what rainbow trout would prefer. Again, the drumlins in particular. So what's interesting here is that a lot of our Pacific salmonids might not be able to reach our maximum production potential in these warmer drumlins tributaries. That may create a niche habitat where we can go and look at Atlantic salmon as they can tolerate those warmer temperatures. And I'll come back to that a little bit later here. So that was just temperature. Now when we looked at the rest of the habitat here, we did find suitable habitat in terms of just about everything in both of our watersheds. But Fish Creek did have a slight advantage in that the habitat was slightly more suitable for juvenile Atlantic salmon. Again, that's not to say that the drumlins didn't offer some uh, suitable habitat because they definitely did. Um, but overall, Fish Creek was slightly more suitable. So that's our habitat suitability. And now I'm going to transition to habitat accessibility. Again, Atlantic salmon are migratory fish. They need to complete part of their lives in lake environments, like Ontario, for example, and spawn in tributaries, typically. So this is a stream that was located in Rice Creek, one of our study streams. And it was removed in 2013 by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to bring the stream back to a more natural state and to promote fish migration here. So this is pre-restoration, and this is what it looks like today. And so unfortunately, I had started this project after the dam was already removed, so I didn't have before and after data to compare with here. But we did have uh, study sites both above and below this dam. And in the foreground here, that was part of one of our study sites, and this is where we saw some of our highest, highest Atlantic salmon growth and survival. And so I bring that up because we're starting to see a lot of these dams being removed for various purposes. A lot of them were installed 50, 75, 100 years ago for various purposes. And they're no longer serving those purposes. A lot of these dams are coming up for relicensing, and they're not being relicensed, so they're being removed. Well, that is opening up a lot of uh, tributary habitat for what could potentially be Atlantic salmon habitat. So I think as these dams are coming out and barriers are being removed, that may increase restoration potential here. <clears throat> so what we had done is looked at the hydrologic and geomorphic characteristics of all the barriers in each of our streams to see if a migrating adult Atlantic salmon could move from a lake environment to tributary habitat. I wanted to do that because restoration of Atlantic salmon, in my mind, connotates a sense that the species needs to be able to naturally reproduce to consider it a, a restored population. So what we found is that in the Drumlin's tributaries, again, these are smaller, relatively small tributaries here, and the migration barriers tended to be smaller uh, on average as well. So in the three streams that we looked at, there was at least one barrier that would limit Atlantic salmon migration to some extent. But at the same time, I think in the, under the right uh, circumstances, high flow events for example, fish would be able to migrate to the upper stretches of some of these tributaries where there is really good spawning habitat. We compared that with what we found in the Fish Creek watershed and these streams tend to be a little bit larger and there is uh, in turn larger barriers here. So we have some significant dams that are definitely going to inhibit Atlantic salmon migration to some of the best uh, habitat. Point Rock Creek, for example, there's a major dam between Oneida Lake and Point Rock Creek that would limit Atlantic salmon from reaching uh, that tributary for spawning purposes. Unfortunately, that happened to be our best stream in terms of habitat where our salmon did the best overall. So kind of an interesting uh, disparity there between regions. So to kind of bring that, this all back together here, what we were finding from our streams is that it seems like that Magog stream can survive warmer temperatures. Whether they had adapted that or adapted to those conditions and tributaries led them for Magog, that may be the case. Uh, again, as in terms of what we expect climate change to do to our streams here in central New York, if we can already identify a strain that can survive these warmer water temperatures, that may give us a leg up in terms of restoration potential. I didn't talk too much about survival because unfortunately our Sebago strain, we didn't have enough fry to stock them out at one fish per square meter like I had intended. And so what I think we were seeing was some density dependent uh, results in terms of survival and growth. But results did indicate that survival was slightly higher in the Sebago strain. And there's other studies that do support this as well, that the Sebago strain is a, a, a likely candidate for restoration. Going back to our habitat here, we're seeing better habitat in Fish Creek, one of those historic Atlantic salmon regions here. But if adults can no longer reach some of those uh, uh, key habitats here, 
restoring a population there is going to be very difficult. Where we look at the drumlins here, accessibility is going to be a little bit better here. Unfortunately, the habitat in some cases might be less uh, optimal uh, or suboptimal, but I think conditions are still going to allow Atlantic salmon to exist in some of these tributaries, especially these warmer tributaries where Pacific salmon cannot uh, do well in. We did see some evidence of adults and spawning in our drumlins tributaries, but we didn't find any natural reproduction. We didn't find any juveniles there. So it may be that these streams are limiting our Pacific salmon in production potential, and that may be. Uh, an opportunity to look at Atlantic salmon restoration. So what does all this mean in terms of restoration potential here? Well, as I mentioned, until recently, uh, results for Atlantic salmon restoration have been pretty limited. But we're starting to see some really, really fascinating results with the USGS's work in the Salmon River, the Bring Back the Salmon Initiative on the North Shore of tributaries, where we're having adults returning to stocking tributaries, and we do have uh, significant evidence that spawning natural reproduction is going on here. So I think if we can expand some of these study areas and look at something like a drumlins tributary where there's a current void in the niche habitat here, that might open up our uh, Atlantic salmon restoration potential even more. So I think uh, restoration for Atlantic salmon is going to continue to trend upwards, especially as there's renewed interest in restoring the species here. Um, again, there's a, a multitude of reasons why we would want to bring the species back into the watershed. And so I, I think the prospect is really good. And so with that, I want to thank uh, everybody that was involved in this project. Uh, my funding source is ESF and the New York Sea Grant. Uh, from everybody at the DEC that provided our licenses and permits to do our field work, I really, really appreciate it. And then the Vermont Fish and Wildlife, Fish Creek Atlantic Salmon Club, and Morrisville State College who provided our salmon resources, reared the salmon for us, and, and really gave a lot of logistical support. So with that, thank you to everybody for coming out. It was a great turnout, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions.
if I'm around still, though, I would definitely like to check that out. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Salmon restoration. Thanks, Justin. Yes. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.